Really, really warm welcome to everybody. Thank you so much for joining today's Deep Adaptation q and I'm not Jem Bendel, the uh, eagle-eyed amongst you may have spotted. I, my name is Katie Carr. I've been working with Jem on Deep Adaptation for the last few years and he's not very well today so um, asked me to step in and I'm really, really delighted to, I'm particularly excited to, to be here and meet Nadine um, and explore this, this really, really important topic. Uh, seeing some familiar faces pop up on the screen and that feels really, really good. Um, so I have been given um, some information about Nadine, which I'm gonna to read to you, but then I'm gonna ask her to introduce herself. So Nadine is chair of the Climate Psychology Alliance in Scotland. She is a visiting researcher at the Pentland Centre for Sustainability and Business at Lancaster University. And she works as a social researcher in the Scottish Government, currently leading the research on Scotland's Climate Citizens Assembly. Following a PhD in the psychology of pro-environmental behaviour, she worked in the science team of the IPCC Technical Support Unit for Working Group 2 in the sixth assessment report cycle. And Nadine is also a mindfulness and nature-based coach and trainer. Nadine, I'd really love to hear you introduce yourself a little bit. I'm particularly curious about um, hearing a little bit about uh, your journey, like what led you here to be in a, in a Q and A on deep adaptation, climate psychology and collapse. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, so hello everyone. Uh, so yeah, my, um, well, <laughs> I think I first met Jem in 2015 or 2016. I can't remember now, um, when I was doing my PhD and, um, he'd organized a research festival and, uh, I was presenting my research there and running a nature connection, uh, workshop. And, um, but my interest, um, in this this the, how we cope with stress um uh traumatic events um and how that affects not just our well-being but the way that we are in the world how how we relate to others how we make decisions is has just kind of grown from there um and that's you know very much a, an interest of the climate psychology alliance which which i'm part of um and it kind of has started to to kind of creep into all sorts of different areas of my life so you know it's part of my own kind of personal interest and personal practice and for myself um and also the work which i do with others and and even uh, to, to some extent um what i do in scottish government because i also teach mindfulness um sessions in there so i think I think that's the reason why Jem invited me to do this Q and A. Um, I I was I last year became really interested in the area of intergenerational trauma for mainly personal reasons because uh, last year my dad died and there was there was work um, that I was doing um, in the months before and after around all of that, um, and that kind of really shone the light on the importance of of understanding not just intergenerational trauma but but other you know lots of other forms of trauma and how that all interacts with other kind of chronic toxic stress and um to affect um our our immune systems and our nervous systems um, and i was also thinking about it in the context of covid and why are black and asian people so more vulnerable to COVID and, um, you know, and the kind of the underlying health um, um, inequalities around all of that. And well, why, why, why do people have, have these, um, these conditions and why is there a higher prevalence of it? Um, and, and so some of what I was doing last year was kind of a really deep dive into the work of uh, Gabor Mate, who I'm sure many of you will be familiar with with the work that he does around um emotional stress and and how that affects you know um 
immune system and 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 has effects on on physical and mental health um and also just work around um yeah uh, ancestral wisdom and i was got very interested and did work um with um uh rabbi doctor um terza firestone and you know so that there's there's a whole lot of stuff that's that, that i've been really looking at last year that's but but one of the things which I, I'm particularly interested in talking about today is um, is Taoist physical arts practice because that's something which I've been doing for 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 a long time and it it comes into my mindfulness teaching a lot um, much more so now than you know ever before <laughs> and uh, yeah I think there's there there's a lot there that's just really interesting to to discuss with you and yeah. and everybody that's here today and to explore that aspect of it further so yeah thank you there's yeah there's there's so much in this terrain uh, so much that i'm really fascinated to get into with you um the way that this is going to work with um nadine and i will be chatting for about the next 15 20 minutes um trying to uh get into some of those topics and then nadine is going to share kind of a five minute practice with us is that right um and that before we then move on to the the q a part of of this session so um the part of what you said which which really excited me one of the parts was um looking at intergenerational trauma um because i know that there's a lot of different ways of understanding and uh, addressing even making sense of, of what it is and what it means but I think there are some steps before there, aren't there? We, we, maybe we could start with just exploring from your perspective what resilience means in this in this area and why it's important. Yeah, and 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 well, and and in the context of you know deep adaptation and and um, so I mean quite simply, um, in order to kind of cope with everything that's happening and everything that's likely to come our way in the coming years the 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 more resilient we are psychologically um emotionally um the more connected we are to others and um, the better able we will be to you know to deal with all of that in a in a in a positive kind of constructive way and to be able to to help and support other people so that's the sort of uh starting point if you like and and um so you know so here's a metaphor coming from from Darius physical arts practice so this this includes like qigong tai chi soft kung fu but also like kai men this is a, a Taoist yoga and uh, dai yin um respiration theory but the but, uh, um, respiration therapy but this is um so if you think of a tree in a strong wind um which has uh how how, how does that tree cope with with being in a strong wind it needs strong roots deep into the the earth and a flexible trunk um and um so we can think about that in terms of ourselves as well and our our connection down into the earth our ability to kind of flex and um, so there's a physical you know a, a literal physical dimension to this but also kind of mentally um and so, so, you know, this is what we want to be like if we can. <laughs> and then if you think about um, this concept of like adversity based growth or, or post traumatic growth, you could think of maybe like a tree that's that's kind of growing out of a, a cliff face or somewhere that's that's not ideal. And yet somehow it's still managing to, to, to grow up and, and to live its life, maybe not as as fully as it would if it was in kind of uh, ideal conditions um but it has to adapt to, to, to that circumstance and it can still you know it could it could it can it can thrive still so um i find those kind of helpful metaphors really um so yeah so that's that's the kind of starting point then and then to go into the idea of 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 trauma and and chronic stress uh well toxic stress because because stress can also be good we need it you know <laughs> just to be alive so um there's there's the kind of the good stress but we're talking today about the kind of the toxic stress um and how um 
yeah that how, how that then affects us yeah yeah thank you because it is when that that um image that you shared of a of a tree and a kind of in the moment resilience i'm thinking about um my cats do not store fear i know that when they're when they're stressed they do stuff they shake or you know they they have a really really big stretch and then they just sleep really peacefully so there's the practices for like general good maintenance day-to-day moment to moment but then looking at at trauma is a, is a different kind of yeah it's, it's a different animal altogether isn't it and so I wonder if you could speak to that. Yeah, just, yeah sure. Yeah. And um, so there's different types of um, kind of trauma. But I, I, I like the way that um, you, you'll keep hearing me refer to Cavernati's work. But I do like the way that, that he talks about this as, as that the trauma is the wound um, as a result of an, of an event. Um, you know, so there's some sort of overwhelming threat. Um, you know, some sort of deep fear about survival. And, and also the thing which he emphasizes is that is about being alone with the hurt. And I think that's a, an interesting point, which we'll probably come back to. Um, um, and the fact that wounds that haven't healed are, are, are um, they're kind of sensitive. So there's a kind of scar there, which, which if it doesn't heal is kind of, you know, so there might be a kind of hyper reactivity. So it can be, it can be triggered. So it's, it's the way that that then kind of dysregulates the nervous system. Um, and, um, so without going into deep into the kind of neurophysiology of all of this, partly because I'm not an expert in it, <laughs> but, um, the, what kind of interests me about it personally as well is, is, and this is the intergenerational aspect of it, which is how, how if something isn't healed in one generation, it can be passed on. So this can happen through epigenetics, um, you know, and there's a whole kind of science around that. Um, but it's also just in, you know, how our parents um, behave towards us, how they treated us when, when we were children, which, you know, is, is influenced by um, how their parents treated them and so on, you know, so if, if emotional, um, stresses and things that weren't weren't resolved then stuff gets passed on so that's the sort of the basic concept of intergenerational trauma that that wasn't what isn't healed gets passed on um and i think people kind of have a sense of that anyway because you can you know you just look back in into your own ancestry and you might see patterns there certain patterns of behavior but what 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 kind of the key point really is um is symptoms so how how is you know if there if if someone's not um manifesting any symptoms of trauma or chronic stress then great there's you know there's nothing to do there so it's it's for when things are manifesting and of course people might not be consciously aware that that they are displaying these these symptoms and that's um um a part of the work isn't it to become to become aware of these things but when we do um we can you know this this area of kind of um science that looks into neuroplasticity tells us that th- you know we can change things can change we can change our nervous systems we can so um so things aren't fixed is the is the kind of the key point there and and but you know it takes it takes kind of work so um for me it's i don't know i've probably been doing stuff off and on for 30 years or something. <laughs> and I'm sure, you know, I'll continue for the rest of my life. But um, I'd say in the past year and a half in particular, um, is really when 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 a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of insights kind of came, came through and I just really kind of learned a lot more about all of that. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, thank you. You, you mentioned, um... Gabor Mate a couple of times and um, I, I watched his for anybody who doesn't know he he made a documentary which was released last month it was free to view for a week and then there's been so much demand it's free to view again or donation based to view again for the next ooh, until the end of the day on the 1st of August so if anybody hasn't seen it oh, it is an incredible 
piece of documentary making really really powerful um, it is great and there's a series of talks around there as well which which is great yeah. but i sorry i just wanted to say so here, here's another metaphor <laughs> which is um if thinking about a, a kind of a root bound um pot plant and so, so this is kind of how how trauma or chronic stress might be affecting us because it's there, there's something that's constricting us in in being you know fully who we are and um and um but if we can are able to kind of transplant this plant into in, into the ground where its roots can can grow out and, and and spread out more um and and also crucially to connect into the mycelium network um where they, they can then access nutrients um this 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 is also part of kind of resilience so um it's this idea that this is kind of this is part of the healing process right is how is how we can think of ourselves as moving into the kind of from 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 a restricted pot into open ground where we can connect um and and through that connection is kind of where co-regulation can happen as well so um i've been kind of i also got really into polyvagal theory <laughs> um, last year but the, but the basic idea about co-regulation is just the way that our nervous systems um respond to other nervous systems you know um and uh yeah so we're affected by other people and we affect other people yeah thank you and i know that you're you're really keen to move on to the um the, the practices the the healing approaches um around that so i'm, I'm gonna ask you to talk about that a little bit building on like the, the first thing and per particularly something that I um, have been focusing a lot in the deep adaptation forum over the last couple of years is the first step is to for all of us to become more literate you know more able to first of all listen really deeply to our own bodies and second of all understand when we might be encountering somebody who is responding from a place of fear or or stored trauma and um, yeah the the thing i'm and, and you talked a little bit to me about the the kind of approaches and practices that you you've got and i'm fascinated about this idea of um you know the fact that it's, it's this is not looking for a big cathartic healing that it's a titration mm -hmm. process that it's just learning to touch gently just touch gently and feel a little bit at a time is that, yeah I, yeah that's, Kind of approach yeah and i mean and, and at times there may be some kind of major breakthrough but but yeah it's not dependent on on major breakthroughs or certainly you know at times I've, i might have had them but it's 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 also been other sorts of things yeah for sure um so i think what i will do for to answer this is um i actually just kind of want to demonstrate something because there's there's it's it's a sort of general principle that i kind of work with and um and it's it's just sort of the idea of self-regulation right but and um, and uh, the way that i tend to do this is by um demonstrating it you know to people where you're kind of standing on one leg and there's kind of th in a very simplified way there's there's three stages that are happening here where the the first stage is um you know there's 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 feedback signals right that, that are going on and and so there's attention that's being paid to the feedback signals and then there's um those feedback signals need to be interpreted in a in a way that's accurate and then there's some sort of response and so if i tune into what's happening in my leg as i'm kind of standing here on one leg to avoid me from kind of totally falling over there's there's kind of you know little adjustments which are happening all the time in in response to you know this feedback and if something went wrong either with the the, the the noticing or the interpretation or the response you know i'd fall over so that's that's the kind of um that's the kind of self-regulation thing and um but to attend we need that kind of sensitivity um to, to to actually be able to feel what's going on to be in connection um to be able to kind of witness to 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 listen you know to the body um and then this thing the stage of kind of interpreting those signals so this is where um if someone has been dysregulated if their nervous system has been kind of dysregulated from trauma or, or chronic stress then they might be hyper vigilant right so they might be 
the they might be detecting threat when in in situations of safety and um, so there's some sort of distortion then that's happening at that interpretation level so then when they come to respond to a situation they, they might be a bit off right with their response um so you know and this is this is also what we do when we're doing mindfulness practice so, so that's so that's um yeah that's the, the one of the sort of principles behind it um and so um yeah so so Taoist physical arts like qigong and 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 similar practices are are one modality right in 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 a mix of of a whole load of other modalities um and what i particularly like about it is because it kind of fits with um with my worldview really you know um about um you know how it's all about kind of following the patterns of nature balancing different energies um and you know particularly i might talk a little bit more about the kind of the, the masculine feminine aspects uh, you know um improving kind of energy flow but but also in terms of specifically around stress is is the way that these practices can help to transform stress into vitality so it's all i mean stress is kind of energy it's it's you know locked in particular bits of body but we can release that and then that releases that transform that energy into a different type of energy that we can use um and people can feel that sometimes in practice when they start feeling tingling and you know in their in their in parts of their body and things like that and you know because it helps us to get into this um parasympathetic nervous system state of relaxation and calm and um you know the kind of the ventral vagal state <laughs> uh where we really want to be making decisions from as opposed to from this you know a, a, a kind of a threat response state um either either kind of fight or flight or, or kind of freeze so um my own just about my own kind of experiences around this um so i have been working for years <laughs> on um the, the kind of the soft hard you know masculine feminine energies which which we all have within us and um you know the, the, the kind of the dy dynamic balance between that and my a lot of what you learn when you're doing um Taoist arts practices including uh, martial arts is learning how to be soft in the face of you know threat um, and if anybody's ever been drunk and had an accident you'll know that you, you you're not as injured <laughs> um so yeah so my kind of tendency has been to be kind of um you know to 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 tense or to to think that i've got to be tough or strong or sometimes a bit forceful or controlling and so the learning has been about how learning how to be soft and that sensitivity to kind of to really feeling as well um also um a, a tendency in the past to kind of withdraw so you know the work then has been about kind of reaching out and um, to be able to connect and um, to allow myself to be felt by others as well as me feeling people um and the strength that there is in that in that vulnerability you know as well as the the kind of strength that you get through softness which is counterintuitive and there's exercises that we do which you need a partner for so it's really difficult to 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 do online but 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 where people can get a real sense of how softness is stronger than hardness you know um and and really nice exercises where if someone had um their hand up this way and you put your hand this way and very light touch but you have to stay in connection and and you can really tune in and and, and really feel with your eyes shut you know what the other person is doing so there's all these kind of practices like that which i love um and the other thing which I think, I'll, I mean, I can talk a lot more about this, about the symptoms which I'd experienced in myself and then thought, oh, you know, what's going on here, right? This is a this is either a residue of a intergenerational trauma or it's something, you know, that an experience that, 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 that I've had my, myself, who knows, right? Some stuff, it, you don't even necessarily need to know exactly where it came from, but um, so that I'll mention two things, um, and, and then if people are interested and ask questions, you know, I can talk about more of that. But one, one was about healing shame, um, about not belonging, 
and this so this i think has aspects of intergenerational as well as as well as you know just de developmental and relational trauma of growing up in a racist society basically right um which and there, there, there there's a line in that trauma of wisdom i think it's i don't think it's Gabramati, i think it's someone else who says it but but they basically say how um which i love and it's it's i read it it says um the march of time decontextualizes trauma so it is interpreted as something that is wrong with me and i think that's, that's so insightful so yeah the thing about not belonging i think is very much part of of what it's like to live in a racist society as as well as a sexist society to some extent as well perhaps but um and um and how i came to heal that without consciously doing it like i didn't set out <clears throat> i'm going to heal this because i didn't really know that that's what was going on it was only when i wrote an essay about it and it, uh, that kind of revealed itself in the writing of the essay um, but, I, but that came through the kind of the nature of connection work and other, other stuff which I was doing to where I came to this realization that I belong to the earth, right? Not, not just an intellectual understanding, but a real embodied understanding. And also the, the other thing which comes with racism and sexism is, is a shame around not being worthy. You know, that's part of what you're internalizing there. Um, so this is all stuff, you know, which, which has its place in it's, it's in the body in, in that you've been living with for years, so deep, you might not even be aware of it, you know, so this is stuff which can then come out. And then just just lastly, before we get to half past, um, I had been for, oh gosh, I'd say it's easily six or seven years when I'd been meditating, I had been noticing physical sensations in the heart so that it, there was no thoughts associated with it there was not, there wasn't even any emotion associated with it but it was a physical sensation of just thumping heart so not not a racing heart but just absolutely thumping and kind of pain and it was and it was i had no idea what was going on i talked about it with loads of kind of sort of buddhist kind of teachers and stuff like this and and i eventually only just quite recently actually came to real to, to think that this was a kind of this was some sort of residue of fear right that was in my body it'd been completely decontextualized from whatever had caused it in the first place but i was left with some sort of trace anyway that's kind of gone now after all the work i did last year thank goodness but um um yeah there's so, so much more to say around that things around my posture hunched posture all about kind of protecting the heart you know and um yeah so if people are interested i'm quite happy to talk more about that but the, but the, the, these are the feedback signals so this was this was what was showing to me um that there were things there that i that were that were deep in the body and that you know if i didn't want it to to affect my health more then um these are things to to work on but but last lastly <laughs> i just really want to say that i don't see all of this work as just being about you know, for individual benefit. I'm actually not that interested in that. I mean, it's great, right? But for me, it's all about how can how can we be of service to others, you know, human, non-human, of service to, to the earth more generally, and to be of service then if we're in a good place ourselves, well, so much the better, right? So that's that's kind of what's, what's driving it for me. So yeah. maybe I could go, bang on about this for ages but I'll, I'll stop so <laughs> yeah. thanks so much I was um so much of what you were talking about particularly then when you you touched upon your experiences of um like the impact on your body of this stored yeah really closely connecting with my own experiences about just knowing my body was was closing in to protect what felt like the softest, most vulnerable pieces, yeah. After after a particularly traumatic experience, so and, yeah, yeah, a lot of learning and realization in that. Absolutely, and and just and 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 with here, I think this is a kind of really important point, which is that we we could, we might notice it as so you know tightness in the shoulders, um, and I think to rush in and try and release. The tightness can be a real mistake because because it's the body is doing stuff to protect us. It's doing it for a good reason, and if the heart isn't ready, 
so open then then that's you know that's when people can have problems i think in doing these sorts of practices because they're 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 kind of they're going too fast mm -hmm. and i and i think there's a there's a um a, a, an interesting paradox this kind of yin yang paradox of of, of the, the the frame climate emergency right which is all about cl climate emergency which is which is really emphasizing urgency <laughs> And yet, at the same time, a lot of what we need to be doing is actually slowing down. Um, you know. Yeah, so. definitely. And and that um, I thought about this earlier when you talked about the work with the masculine and feminine energies, and that I know that I can connect with what had been previously an unconscious, internalized, quite violent part. It was like something's going wrong with you now. You need to force yourself to get better because yeah otherwise you're unworthy and yeah and connecting with the other more gent there's nothing to be done just listen just learn to listen mm. so um yeah, thank yeah. You. that's so, probably a good place to go to the practice then right yeah i was about to say i just want to um mention to people i know that some people have shared some questions already um and nadine had meant had yeah spoken to me earlier about some curiosity about whether this practice shifts the kinds of questions that people here are curious about finding out about. It may or may not, uh, but just to just to pin that there. And um, yes, so looking forward yeah. to hearing this. Yeah, let's, let's go for it. So the first thing to say is this is just an invitation. And um, and um, so you just do what, what feels right for you. And if, if for some reason, you start to feel kind of um, uncomfortable about anything and back off and stop and, you know, stand up or shake around. We're not going to do anything particularly in depth, but um, just to say that up front. So uh, it's a sitting practice. Um, so just starting by, by rubbing the hands together, get some energy in the hands and then play. Oh, I'll just move my camera down slightly so you can might be able to see a bit better. Um, and um, yeah, so just placing them over the heart and then um, just just beginning with slowly moving your arms over this the heart area. So a really gentle massage here and then you can just uh, have a, a little smile on your lips and you're just sending that smile inside down into the heart area and if you like to visualize you can you can visualize a, a small bud a red bud and the sun shining down onto this little flower and as you're breathing in and you're sending this little smile down into your heart the bud is just it's just starting to open out and blossom. So this is you just sending good wishes to yourself, wishing yourself well, as much as you're able to in this moment. And then we're going to send these good wishes out into the world. So to do this, we can put our hands together like this at the heart. And then breathing in. And then as you're breathing out, you're sending that out into the world. So you're just sending, straightening your arms out to the side. And then bringing it, bringing, you know, the good, the good wishes, you know, the healing energy of the universe back into yourself. So whatever we're putting out into the world, we always want to bring it back in. Um, and we can't give out what we don't have so we want to be building up our inner resources and one way to do that is by bringing in the energy of the universe into ourselves as well as you know eating well and sleeping well and breathing well and all the other things that help our vitality so just just feeling just feeling that and then if you like to, to end, you can just settle your hands on your belly. I'm just breathing into the belly. So feeling pressure of the belly up against the hands as you breathe in. 
and how it retreats away from the hands as you breathe out. So that's a short little exercise to end on there. Thank you. Would you like to, um, maybe we'll go straight into the questions, Nadine, rather than hearing from people. Is, yeah. Sure. Oh, <laughs> it's really shifted my, my energy, even my capacity to make narrative sentences. <laughs> to have dissolved a little bit. Um, so if you haven't already, and if a question is arising for you, please send it to Stuart in the chat. And um, I am going to go to Amelia. Uh, first of all, Amelia, can you unmute yourself? And if your video isn't on yet, then turn it on for us and ask your question. Hello, hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, how can you connect with people um, who seem part of the problem, as in um, big cars, lots of houses, skiing holidays, and how can you connect in a society that hasn't valued uh, the same things as you? So the environment, motherhood, um, and instead they valued money and status. Mm. Yeah, so this, <laughs> these, it's not easy for sure. Um, and, but I think it's for me personally anyway, um, what I've been trying, <laughs> part of what I'm trying to do is, is 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 to really cultivate kind of compassion because when, because if you think about behaviours as just being that's just the surface level, but there's all sorts of things underneath that's 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 driving those behaviours, and um, uh, and if you go into the the, the, the social psychology um, work around this, um, a lot of what's driving um those destructive behaviors is um you know anxieties and fears um I, so it's 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 a way of coping with with threat um and so i think it's it's when we first of all recognize in ourselves that we also have um ways of behaving which are not perfect <laughs> far from perfect um and um things which are destructive even um and you know we're, we're all we're all complex like that and and that so we can have compassion for ourselves and then we can see other people behaving in particular ways and rather than having a kind of us them thing which I think is deeply unhelpful and also is not a, a kind of a Taoist approach um, which doesn't see things in those sort of binary separate categories um, then it allows us to at least begin to to see the humanity of of this other person with whom you know we might be thinking really negative thoughts about right um, because if we go to them with those negative thoughts and, and kind of throw that in their face, that's they're just going to get even more defensive. So that's not going to help shift anything. But mm. in, in any case, I think it always starts with ourselves anyway. <laughs> uh, I think it's very difficult to be compassionate to other people if we can't be compassionate to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. an ongoing practice, right? Because a lot of us are very self-critical. Yeah. Thank you. And... Um... Thank you very much for the question, Amelia. I'm, I want to, um, we do have another couple of questions from the audience, but I wanted to ask you something specifically about, uh, oh, I start to shake a little bit as I think I think of the, the question, is knowing that um, the world feels really precarious now for a lot of people, and that isn't going to, it's not likely to stop. It's likely to be getting increasingly ramped up maybe slowly maybe quite quickly oh, yeah, it's, it is shaky and um and also connecting with something that you that you said earlier about the um the sense of urgency and emergency and um i wonder whether you could talk something about for me there feels like a paradox um around 
I know that for me, the more urgent things feel, the more I have to connect with stillness. Even though that feels like, but there's so much to do. Ah! I know I have to connect with stillness and I have an intuitive sense it's to do with listening to my body. I have an intuitive sense it's to do with cultivating compassion. Um, I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, for sure. And I, I mean, this totally fits with with the kind of the, the, the Taoist perspective and, and, and what you do when we're doing these practices. Um, because, I, I mean, I think some things are outside of time, um, actually. And um, I mean, it kind of links to sort of polyvagal theory in the sense that 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 kind of the urgency, right, the fact that the speed that, the, the, uh, you know, rushing is 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 kind of coming from this place of a of a sympathetic nervous system response is kind of fight or flight is this it's you know it's got that stress um quality to it um and that's difficult to maintain over time because of the way that stress affects the body so um you know that's going to exhaust us at being in that state um but 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 but, but more than that is the point that we were talking about that to to really to, to really develop that sensitivity to to feeling what's going on within us and, and you know around us and with other people we do have to slow down because it's because because that it's in the detail you know and if you're rushing too fast you just and of course rushing is a very good way of distracting ourselves <laughs> from actually you know going to what is there right um but also stillness can seem like a very dangerous place to be if we're in this dysregulated state because it it can it can be it might be misinterpreted you know as as being collapse so being in that kind of hypo arousal place of 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 you know severe kind of um dissociation and numbness and depression and despair and things like that yeah um, yeah, that's that's really interesting. I know both of those. I know the start, the stillness, which is flat, and I also know the stillness, which is there's so much going on, and I need to just sit and be with it for as long as it needs me to sit and be with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I used to really struggle. Well, I I used to find it really difficult to to just be still and on my own, and I'd kind of want to fill the silences or, or, or fill those gaps, you know, and it, and it took, um, you know, and I, I, I know, you know, and that's linked with all sorts of other stuff around escapism and numbing and, and all sorts of kind of, uh, other, other great ways to kind of, um, distract yourself and things, you know, but, um, but yeah, it's, that's working through that I think is really important. Yeah. And in, in Gabor Mate's documentary, which I feel like I'm going to be ranting on about for quite some time, he talks about the fact that many of those distractions are really wise ones. Like our body yeah. knows sometimes that to go to that place where the wound is would be overwhelming. Yeah, and there, yeah, and there exactly. Are some, some habits of distraction which are far more destructive than others. But the key thing is about using them wisely and consciously rather than an unconscious uh compulsive behaviors yeah and it, it comes back again to the kind of the yin yang thing of not wanting to force things um so if you're not you you can't force your body you know mm. you can't force your nervous system to, to 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 open up to stuff if it's not ready to, to to do that you know and so um you know which comes back to what i was kind of saying about this the, you know the hunched thing and you know lifting the chest because to lift the chest is to really claim your place in the world it's a very confident posture and um you know you've you've <laughs> you can pretend you know and that can help as well by just adopting the posture it can kind of change the mind but long term yeah it's it's it, it unfolds and it's i mean this is what i mean by some stuff just being out of time think you have this is the just allowing things to unfold in their own way you can't you know, and actually the forcing of it can be really, really harmful. And when, when people have negative experiences with mindfulness meditation, for example, some of that is to do with, with people kind of forcing, forcing stuff. 
Mm, I'd love to hear more about that, but I know that this isn't about me and my curiosity. I've got another <laughs> couple of questions. Um, I want to go to uh, Julia Hobson next. Julia, if you can unmute yourself and turn your video on, please. Um, I, can you hear me? I've unmuted, I think. Yep, we can hear you. Good. I can't see you and I can't quite manage to. Sometimes you come in and sometimes you come disappear into the blackness. Um, yeah, so the question I wanted to ask was, Nadine, when you're working with um, in your position with the Scottish Government, um, do you do these sorts of exercises that we just did, the little one with the heart or similar ones, with um, government officials and do you do them at all before they might be going into making decision making meetings and if so how has that how has that worked out yeah so um so my my main job uh, the job which i'm paid to do <laughs> is uh, to be a researcher and um, because i am trained in teaching mindfulness and separately you know i have my my um public liability insurance and all the rest of it um I had already started doing some mindfulness teaching before COVID, um, but during, you know, all of last year, because of the amount of pressures on on staff, um, which were huge, obviously, in, in dealing with, with everything, um, just for, in terms of supporting well-being, I, I was asked, uh, I offered and I was asked if I would lead sessions, which, which I do, so that's within work time. Mm -hmm. um and and um, so it's great i have a lot of freedom <laughs> around that but they're you know they're kind of like one hour ish kind of introductory sessions mm -hmm. but there's a lot of practices i've learned i mean i had previously taught in, in in organizations um but i've really learned a lot about about teaching in the context of an organization and what works and what doesn't work but there's a lot of, of really short practices which are great for just kind of releasing stress as you go <laughs> Um, and, um, um, so what, uh, you know, so, so there's been a lot of interest in these and I'm, I'm continuing to do them and I do some follow-up sessions where I just focus on a particular theme and, you know, we kind of explore that. The last one I did was about being like water, which was great. Um, now what people do with that in, and, and, uh, in their day, I mean, this is in work time, so it's not like people have to take time out to do it. Um, you know, I don't know because I'm not formally doing it as part of research. Um, and I don't really mm -hmm. want to either. So, um, so yeah, mm -hmm. who knows? I mean, people are in and out of meetings the whole day. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I mean, I get good feedback and people tell me it's helping them. So, uh, but you know, there's obviously other things that they're, they're, they may be doing as well that might be helping so i can't claim all the credit for <laughs> well I, I guess one thing that i'm i'm intrigued by is how something that's been so devastating and uh with like with the COVID has then opened another door that maybe wouldn't have been opened in in an organization and let in certain possibilities and i think that's that's fantastic mm. yeah i think that's right and also it it's it's allowed um to for for me to to, to do well more body-based work which i which I, I i think works particularly well in organizations because going straight mm -hmm. from being very very active and and to then kind of sit, you know just doing a real stillness practice very very mm -hmm. hard but 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 a movement practice is kind of a transition and i think it works beautifully um mm -hmm. So, yeah, and also then doing work around emotion regulation, including climate emotions. So it opens up the door for, yeah. for, for, for bringing that in, which is great. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nadine, I have got, I think, three more questions. We might go a couple of minutes over. Um, but first of all, to Andrew Medhurst, which touches on what you've been talking about before. Um, He's asking for some help. Andrew, are you there? Yes, I am. So, um, Nadine, thank you very much for what you've said to us this morning. Um, and my question is, any tips from Nadine? Um, the context for that question is, I have this 
I have this contradiction in my in my mind and in my life about modern technology, email. I mean, my background is a very corporate background, and when I was still in the in the corporate world, it was a people used to go off to Taoist retreats for a fortnight, right, to unplug and then put themselves back in that. There's a part of me that says my connection to people who understand the climate emergency has come through technology, but I also have this sense that some of the some of these technologies, social medias, have shot my attention span to pieces. And so there's a part of me that says, any tips about how you manage that? This is how I connect at the moment, and and in reality, stillness and slowing down and calmness makes me want to just switch off every last piece of computer equipment I've got. So just any tips about how you, you feel that that can be managed, please. Mm, yeah. So have you got a, a kind of a daily practice that you do, whether that's kind of exercise or, you know, being outdoors and doing you know, just being with trees or right. no, I guess but I, you know, I've hugged a few trees in the last few weeks, but um, but no, I think I think my problem partly is I I'm in a privileged position. I get up in the morning and there's many days I'm thinking about, well, how do I fill my day? And I get to the end of the day and I feel I haven't filled it very well, it feels to me like I haven't filled it in a very productive way. And that productive yeah. may, may be my corporate mind thinking I didn't do much today, but it also might be I didn't do much in terms of self awareness and maplessness and that sort of yeah. thing. Yeah. I mean, because there has been loads of work done around the addictive qualities of technology, which are, you know, it's designed in, right, <laughs> to be addictive. So that that's no surprise when people find it difficult to, to drag themselves away. But for me personally, I, I, keep um i try to maintain a kind of a, a daily practice of and and it can be difficult to keep to that you know because there's a discipline associated with that but it might be even kind of putting something in your diary that protects half an hour or an hour or even 10 minutes where you you just you you go outside and you know there are some really nice kind of qigong exercises that are there's you know stuff on youtube which is free i i really like the work that lee holden does and um, you can you can look his stuff up he's got you know really accessible stuff for for beginners as well um and there's something and also it can help to have a, a guided video practice for but definitely a movement thing i would suggest for you then and um, but but what the, the what's beautiful about the the Taoist practices is because it is all about following nature so it's it's what you know you are following the cycles of nature and the patterns of nature even if you're not sure exactly what each movement means that's kind of what's underneath it all um and doing it outside um you know just connecting with the earth and with the sky and having that real sense of 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 connection that groundedness interrupts um you know all that 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 kind of busy mind stuff so I, I don't know that if you know possibly could be something that you look to try and integrate into into your day and and then don't beat yourself up if you don't manage to do it every day <laughs> is, is right. that the sort of thing I'm not sure if that if that helps but I'm a I'm a great one for scheduling things in my calendar so I'm, I'm hearing you loud and clear that I should be <laughs> scheduling those practices in my calendar as well thank you yeah yeah thank you thank you andrew thank you nadine time for one more question um curious one from jonathan if you could unmute yourself and it touches on hi guys yeah thanks paradigm. thanks for hosting this workshop uh so i'm hard physicist uh it and i'm moving from the logical world of science and tech to the coaching world. I feel like the members here are more in the spiritual emotional place rather than the rational place. Um, I'm wondering what we do about actually, what do we do when the rubber hits the road? So how in coaching, how can we move from counseling, 
looking back to coaching where we move forward and actually take some action? Mm, thank you, Jonathan. I chose that question. I had a little sneaky interest in, in it because I'm when, I'm curious about whether it's a false dichotomy. But Nadine, I'm, yeah, great to hear from yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, first off, my, my kind of approach on stuff is kind of bio, psycho, social, spiritual, <laughs> um, all of those things. Um, and my interest in polyvagal theory in, in particular is is the science-based nature of it i really love stuff around um, neuroscience and all that um and and bringing that into the coaching world as many are already um I, that you know that the, there's a whole field of coaching that's 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 kind of trauma-informed and that draws on all that theory um that you could you could connect with if you were interested in um and uh i'm not what was the other point <laughs> you were asking about um so in in my coaching community we we often think of counseling as looking backwards and i'm more forthright and i've got more brutal style it's we acknowledge all that now what are we actually going to do to go to where we want to be yeah and and so your question is what what do you feel about oh, okay. taking yeah. action moving forward to where we want to be yeah so um both and <laughs> so i think dif different they're all they're different approaches right they're different fingers pointing at the moon and and that kind of thing some people f for me counseling and talking psychotherapies are not my thing uh, you know n not interested in it um i trained as a coach but um but it works for some people right so it's it's kind of there and it's in the mix it's from a, in terms of the Taoist physical art practices it's it's about balancing the past the present with the future so with there'll be arm movements um where the, the 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 forward arm is is into the future and the backward arm is into the past and it's interesting when people raise their arms is are they actually in balance or is the the weight of the past you know drawing heavier right but there's ways of kind of bringing what's in from the good stuff from the past that you want into the present and into the future but then then you have to let it go so even if you're focused on what you want in the future to not be kind of fixated on that it's it's you hold it lightly and then and then you kind of let it go to to work its way through in you know in the way that it does so um I have no idea if I answered your question or not, but that's... I, it's very yeah. interesting to hear your spiritual, emotional perspective. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I would suggest that if you're not already familiar with polyvagal theory, you might want to investigate that. Um, and um, uh, there's a, the, you know, there's a, there's a lot of work around that now, and it's it might satisfy the, the, the kind of... the, the science part of you as well mm. thanks very much nadine thank, thank you. you thank you jonathan thank you nadine and um whew, i feel both full and also still hungry for more that's been such a <laughs> such a deep rich um yeah exploration together it has felt really rushed to me it has only because of this hunger for more um and I want to say apologies to, there were a couple of people who submitted questions that I wasn't able to get to, um, but I'm yeah so grateful to all of you for joining. Nadine, for joining us today, for sharing your wisdom and your unique take on this topic. I'm really grateful and not just for this hour, but for all of the work that you're continuing to do in this field. Um, Thank you yeah. very much. And, and by the way, if people, you know, want to drop an email or, or, or something, if you've got if questions or just things that you want to talk about, you know, I'm interested. So um, feel free to get in touch. Um, thank you. Thank you. We will be um, sending up, uh, you'll receive an email uh, after this event. The video will be shared on Jem's YouTube channel. Um, a, 
bit of a plug myself. On the third, I'm going to be hosting a discussion circle for people who have watched uh, Gabor Mate's documentary to think about trauma from a deep adaptation lens and vice versa. So I'll share the information uh, on that as well. And I think that's all. Very, very yeah. lovely to see you all. And um, yeah, Nadine, I hope we can connect another time in the future. Yeah, definitely. And and thanks to everybody for coming. Um, I really appreciate anybody that's interested in listening to and, and being part of conversations. So um, it helps me as well, because, you know, I have to think about what I really think. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you.